Hello and welcome to a Q30 News exclusive interview. I'm Brooke Riley and today I'm joined by Quinnipiac University President Judy Olian. Thank you for joining me, President Olian. I'm delighted to be with you. I think this will be our last time together before you make your momentous move up to Maine. Congratulations on the great position you have in broadcasting. Thank you, I appreciate it. So you've spent just about two full years as the president of Quinnipiac now. Can you talk a little bit about what this experience has been like for you these last two years? Well, the last two years is are hard to characterize in, in some sense because they have been uh, so different and packed and I think in a sense unprecedented. Um, I, I, I feel really terrific about the community that we're part of and you see it when, when it gets tough and, and it is tough now and the community has come together uh, beautifully. The first year was really getting to know the community, the values, how people care about Quinnipiac and what their dreams and visions are about the future. And that's when we built our strategic plan, really our vision uh, for the future. And that was one of the, I think, most important milestones of that first year. We, we put it to bed in May of that first year. And we have the four pillars that we are using as our blueprint for the future, including the future post COVID. Um, I, I feel very good about uh, some of the progress that we've made. Uh, one of our pillars is around inclusive excellence, which is a very important principle that we're following. We signed agreements with community colleges. We invited individuals from uh, New Haven Promise. We uh, created a vice president position for equity and inclusion, who's part of our uh, management team. And uh, we've also made uh, a lot of important hires into our leadership ranks. We hired two uh, new deans in communications and health sciences, two fantastic new deans and also are uh, closing in on the third dean in um, arts and sciences. And then almost the entire senior leadership team, what we call the management committee, is new. Um, and uh, other than the chief financial officer who um, has, I'm very grateful that he's continued on, we have all new members of our team, uh, our, uh, our uh, uh, chief of staff, our uh, VP for marketing and communications, our v VP for development, a new position of general counsel, our um, uh, VP for enrollment management. We just announced uh, the new provost and uh, we are continuing to search for a very important new position that is student facing, who is called the Chief Student Experience Officer, the CXO, who I hope will be joining us uh, in a few months once the uh, final decision is made. So there are a lot of changes and I can talk also about some other developments around facilities and also community relations, but maybe I'll turn it back to you to see what else you'd like to know. Obviously, the second year and this last part of the second year has been very much shaped by our response to the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. But here too, the strength, the values of the community shine through and the resiliency and the nimbleness of being able to turn on a dime, the flexibility of our students, of our faculty and staff the commitment that everyone has to continue uh, the vitality and the academic programs of Quinnipiac uh, has really carried us forward in a way that just demonstrates the strength of all that Quinnipiac stands for. And like mentioned, obviously we're living through unprecedented times with the virus impacting Quinnipiac and the entire United States. Let's rewind a little bit to when we thought this would, could start a, a disruption in life on campus. 
Uh, when did planning for this begin and what was that like for you as president of the university? Well, you know, I come out of uh, the business school environment where you have case studies and I taught leadership for 12 and a half years, but I think that most people would tell you that there's no business case study for this and there frankly isn't um, a, 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 a leadership guidebook on this. This is what you call a, a black swan event, which is very, very unlikely. But you draw on the resources that are around you. And as I said, the leadership at every level of the institution is really reassuring. I'm not in any way alone uh, in leading this institution. It is very much distributed between, among the management committee, the leadership council, all of the layers of administration and academics and facilities that um, uh, are present on campus and our student leadership has been uh, very critical. So in terms of when we started, we actually formed a task force uh, that's called the COVID-19 task force in late January. So once we saw issues in China around this pandemic that was spreading globally, we said we have to start preparing. And that task force is comprised of uh, medical leaders, uh, facilities leaders, academic leaders, administrative leaders, and they meet virtually uh, daily. They have a call every day since January. And they are really looking at all of the uh, responses and anticipatory events that we need to engage in in order to secure the health and well being of our community. And when I say our community, I mean our students, our faculty, our staff, and also the neighboring communities around us where we have an obligation to make sure that we do not in any way burden the healthcare systems around us or um, affect the health and well being of, uh, of the population. So that COVID 19 task force got in gear in late January and has been working ever since daily. And since then, we've um, added some planning groups. Um, and, and we think about the following. We think about respond, which are the immediate responses to the crisis. And you, you've seen a lot of announcements around that. We talk about recovery and we're planning for the full, which is the recovery. And then we talk about thrive as that third layer how do we think about the future post COVID? How do we think about the strategic plan post COVID? And are there any changes in the pillars in, in the strategic plan that can be informed by what we've learned um, during this crisis? And you mentioned a little bit what moving forward is kind of gonna be like with the planning groups. Can you elaborate a little bit more about the beginning stages of this plan? So we have uh, four planning groups, if you will. The first I mentioned, which is the COVID-19 task force, which is responding on a day-to-day -day basis to issues that crop up on a daily basis. So for example, the whole decision around uh, the May 15th, I think it was, um, shutdown of the residence halls and and, and moving to a virtual online environment and remote work environment. That was done very much in coordination with the COVID-19 task force uh, for health reasons, as well as practical facilities reasons and the capacity to transition as we did. And we're fortunate that as a university, we were already uh, very well uh, technology enabled not just in our academic programs, but also in our processes. So the business continuity, in addition to the academic continuity, is something that we had to turn, up, turn on a dime around, but I think was done well because of the leg up that Quinnipiac had through QU Online, through the online classes, and the technology sophistication of our operations. Um, a second task force is now the full planning task force 
which has gotten in gear, especially over the last couple of weeks, and is working daily with its first reports due uh, any day now, to establish alternative scenarios around how we return in the fall to classes and what parameters might need to be managed. For example, uh, the parameters of social distancing. How do we manage classes, uh, res uh, on ground classes in the era of social distancing? How do we manage residence halls if we still need to uh, maintain social distancing? And what do the experts around the state tell us? And there is a reopening uh, committee, which, which I um, am somewhat involved in, um, to the reopening committee. I'm involved in the umbrella organization called Advanced CT uh, that the governor has appointed. And as part of that, there's a reopening committee chaired by Indra Nui and um, the chief epidemiologist from Yale. Uh, they will tell us what the uh, wellness norms need to be as we reopen Connecticut. What are the standards of personal hygiene? What are the standards of care? What are the standards of testing, tracing, isolation that need to be? And we will adjust our full plans around those guidelines. And so the scenarios that are being planned by the full planning task force are very much um, being made with flexibility around what those guidelines might be. The third task force is the Academic Senate Task Force, which is focused on how do you secure and protect the quality of learning under alternative scenarios that might be in the fall. And we're very grateful that the faculty have geared up to, to this extent to say, look, there might be alternative mixed models of delivery. Uh, there might be kind of a super flex model where some students can, can be in residence and still take some classes online and have a mixture and a choice about how they might take classes if we're not fully residential and fully back. And, and so what the Senate committee is looking at is how do we make sure that the quality of learning is as excellent as it always is on at Quinnipiac uh, in the fall under these alternative scenarios. And the fourth group is what we're calling the reimagining committee. And that committee is saying, uh, and, and its time frame is six to 24 months taking the strategic plan that we have and saying, how do we bring those pillars to life, the four pillars in the post COVID environment? What have we learned that may um, help us further advance the strategic plan in the post COVID environment? And here's one example. So our third pillar is around wellness and well being of the community and mental health and um, uh, and physical health are key components of that. And as you know, we're still continuing with our wellness center. The timing may be slowed down a bit, but we're not pulling back on that. But what have we learned around teletherapy and telemedicine that might change the way we embody that third pillar? Under what circumstances can it be effective or more effective? I gotta tell you, I. I had to have um, a, a medical appointment and it was done through telemedicine and I loved it. The doctor was there precisely at the moment. I didn't have to go anywhere. I didn't have to wait. And I got all the information with the singular attention of the doctor. Is that a model that we uh, can learn from? Is there anything else that we should learn from this COVID environment around how we deliver operations or how we provide students with a broader array of choices on how to take classes. So there are two subgroups. We call them skunk work teams, uh, one academic and one operations and services under the reimagine umbrella. And that task force is being chaired uh, by uh, Dean uh, um, Chris Rausch of the School of Communications. 
So you've mentioned that the strategic plan might look a little bit different now and you're working on reworking that. I know another plan that's been in progress is the facilities master plan. And the last I heard, the final product is supposed to be released this May. How has the progress been with this? Has the virus impacted any projects that are in the process of being worked on or in the works right now? So let me just um, make sure th that I clear up that the statement you made about the strategic plan. I don't think we're going to change the broad goals at all or the pillars uh, of the strategic plan. It's just a, a question of whether the way we embody or bring them to reality that they might be uh, tweaked. Because those are goals for the university of the future and they're going to remain uh, the, the goals for our institution. The question is, have we learned some things around this crisis, the way we're working remotely, the way we're delivering remotely, uh, the way uh, some individuals might have preferences for services or a broader array of choices that will make the strategic plan even better. But I don't think the, the broad vision is going to change. And in a sense, it might accelerate our vision of the future when we talked about the kaleidoscope of learners and the kaleidoscope of delivery options and so forth. This has told us that yes, we can. We can do this uh, by offering a broader set of options. On the facilities plan, it is uh, being completed uh, and I expect it uh, in May. And it is a 10 year set of milestones uh, that provide us with choices and options if we are this kind of university of this size with this vision what we might consider how will living occur how will learning occur and what kinds of facilities and, and how will scholarship occur and what kind of facilities fit the various models that we will morph into uh, based on the scholarship learning and residential uh, uh, and other delivery models that will become a reality as these 10 years proceed. And so it provides us with a different set of options and milestones as we move forward. In the near term, we will probably have to slow down a little bit on some of the milestones. And I mentioned that we're proceeding with the Wellness Center but perhaps the delivery time uh, will be delayed a little bit, but we believe that that's a critical dimension of um, our third pillar and who we want to be as a community, healthy and physically healthy, mentally healthy, also enabling our uh, students and faculty to have options on how you deal with a variety of circumstances in life. That's the programming part, part of that. But it might be delayed by a few months in terms of delivery and, and maybe a, a bit more than a few months. Um, we are completing the three residence halls that are um, on tap and we will continue to invest in research facilities, faculty, learning facilities, residence halls, and the social environments like the uh, On the Rocks pub that we just completed before uh, the COVID crisis. So all of that uh, will continue. When, when, when you think about the, the, the crisis that we are still in, the, the pandemic, you have to be operating in three parallel tracks. You have to respond immediately to the exigencies of the moment, to the urgencies of the moment. You have to be planning for the nearer term, like we're planning for the fall. And you also have to remember that there is a tomorrow, that there is a future, that we are going to be Quinnipiac as strong as before. And we can't take our eye off what that future is and continue to invest because this will pass. This period, um, as difficult as it is, will be something that will get into our rear view mirror and we will be back stronger if we learn from the takeaways of this experience. And there's no question that we are learning some good things. 
And the university's budget has obviously been significantly impacted by COVID-19 with having to refund students for housing and dining plans. Um, can you explain where the budget stands right now and how it might look moving forward, especially in the fall? Thanks. Well, obviously that was part, a big part of our response. Um, and uh, it, the, the immediate impact through June 30th which is the fiscal year that we were in, um, was, was very significant. And, and, and the difficult part is that by the time March rolls around, you've already spent three quarters of your budget and you have far fewer degrees of freedom um, to pull back. So the immediate impact was about $40 million. Uh, um, a large part of that was um, the credits that we were issuing uh, to our students. And the other part was the concern about loss of summer um, tuition to the extent that summer was impacted. I'm glad to say that summer uh, is looking strong. Our, the offerings, uh, the online offerings uh, are attractive to our students. They're signing up. And it, it looks like we will recover uh, some of the, the lost tuition that we were presuming. So that left us really with a hole of about 30 million and we had to deal with that through significant cutbacks of our operating budget. And some of that was doable because um, there were some savings, but in the end, we had to cut um, uh, a, a significant amount from our budget now we had the financial strength to be able to do that through June 30th uh, without impacting any of our faculty or staff. Uh, that was a very important priority for us to the extent that we can to keep Quinnipiac's community whole, to keep the family whole. We did cut salaries by three and 5%. Um, I and some members of our management committee uh, took um, higher salary cuts. Um, but what happens on July 1 in the next fiscal year will very much depend on how enrollments shape up and returning students uh, uh, return for next year. And you may know that many institutions, including our own, pushed back the uh, enrollment, the, the deposit date for first year students to uh, June 1 from May 1. So we still have to see how that shapes up. I hope that students are feeling, and their parents, are feeling confident about next year. We are going to be back and we are creating contingency plans for a variety of options uh, to the extent that we have to still be mindful of the health risks of uh, the coronavirus, but we expect to be back at least um, partially, if not largely, in residential form. Uh, and we're waiting to see what Reopen Connecticut uh, determines as the appropriate health precautions. And um, once we see what happens with enrollment, and I hope that all of our students uh, are eager to return. I know I hear from students, they're busting to get out of the house and to come back and be with their friends. Uh, we'll know what, a, what, what the budget looks like and we'll have to make decisions then. And you mentioned about the salary cuts that faculty staff and you and some of the other executives have taken. Do you see these cuts being extended past June 30th at all? I think everything is on the table. Uh, and it all depends on uh, how our enrollments uh, shape up for the fall and, and, and the duration of the year. Again, what we want to do is first and foremost, safeguard the health and wellness of our community, faculty, students, staff, and the broader community. Secondly, make sure that we are delivering the highest quality academic experience. And those will be our priorities in terms of um, how we expend our resources. And then we have to see what is available uh, based on the enrollments. And then there are a lot of options on the table and that would be one of them, but there are many, many others. 
and our faculty and staff have made enormous sacrifices. I mean, some are working around the clock, literally, and doing that despite the fact that they've incurred uh, salary cuts. So I'm confident that our community will rally and continue to rally as it has to this point with these two primary goals in mind, and that is health and wellness of everyone, protecting everyone, and at the same time, uh, delivering the highest quality learning and growth opportunities that our students have come to expect, and I know our faculty and staff deliver. And have any employees been laid off or furloughed, and do you see this happening in the future by any chance? We've been very fortunate that through June 30th, um, given the, the way we've handled the financial impact, we have not laid anyone off or furloughed anyone. And our community places enormous weight on the concept of family, the concept of we. Uh, and instead, we took salary cuts uh, uh, rather than going the furlough and, uh, and layoff route. We have to see where we are on July 1 once we have more information. Uh, obviously, that's the last resort, uh, and I hope we can avoid it, but it depends on the magnitude of any changes that we're looking at in terms of student enrollments and continuing students. And remember that our, our family of parents and students have also been dramatically affected by COVID. I mean, there is a lot of financial hardship out there and we wanna be able to address that financial hardship and help our students return and enroll. Uh, and that's a, a driving piece also of how we think about our budget. How can we manage the student body that's here with the quality experience in a healthy way and also help address what has been a very difficult situation with all of the individuals who have lost jobs or had job cutbacks or themselves been furloughed um, and businesses that have been closed. So you, you try and have this 360 view of all of the uh, needs that we want to address and then we'll look at the budget. We are looking at the budget and that's part of our planning effort on a daily basis. And as the semester comes to a close, what advice do you have for faculty, staff and students working through these difficult times? Well, first of all, to our students um, and especially our graduating students and Brooke, you're one of them. Um, I want to see you at commencement. We're going to have a commencement sometime when, when it's safe and when you can all come back. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you because we miss our students on campus. And for our seniors who are departing, we want to have one extra chance uh, to see you. And I know that many of you are concerned about um, the, the job market and the job prospects. Some of you are going on to graduate school and come back to Quinnipiac if that's part of the, 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 the menu of options for you. Uh, and, and thinking about it more seriously now, uh, given the recovery that still must happen in the economy. I recommend for all our seniors and all of those of you who are looking for internships over the summer, use our alumni network Brooke, you, you, in your TV interviews, you, you talked about just the help that you got from alumni. I mean, your job in Maine was enabled uh, through a door opened by an alumnus, uh, an alumnae. Uh, and I think that that is gonna be possible for many of our students. So use the Bobcat Net. We sent out a note to all our alumni uh, yesterday to make sure that they are shaking the trees on behalf of our students who are graduating or who need internships and for them to reach out to us through the Bobcat Net. And uh, I hope that you do use all of the resources available to you on campus, 
career advisors, alumni and faculty to help you transition into the workforce because that's, we're here for you. Um, to staff and faculty, first of all, my heart goes out to you. You have made it possible through your generosity, through your kindness, through your tireless efforts to, for Quinnipiac to stay Quinnipiac, for Quinnipiac to not lose a beat and the business continuity as well as academic continuity has happened in such a strong way because of our faculty and staff. And many of them are themselves going through hardships, are homeschooling, are caring for parents, are um, experiencing some of the effects of COVID themselves directly. Um, all I can say is that my heartfelt thanks to the depths of what you've done and be strong. We will get through this. We are now starting to talk about reopening and we will get through this as a family, as a, as a Quinnipiac family. There are all kinds of virtual programs that are going on. Uh, yesterday, I saw that 200 plus people joined Cindy Bigelow of Bigelow, Tree, of Bigelow Teas to learn about tea. We have exercise classes, we have lectures. Um, be part of the virtual uh, quad in all of the events that are occurring, including organized by our students. And uh, find moments during the day to look after yourselves. Go outside when it's nice weather, exercise, take walks, spend time with family, enjoy those special moments that uh, you could have with family now that you are together. Get on virtual dinners with your friends. And by the way, cook, because I'm finding from many people that they're eating a lot healthier now that they're at home and cooking with their families. I find that to be the case for me. I am eating a lot healthier. Uh, so, so use this moment to do some things that you wouldn't otherwise have the time to do. Hobbies, clean up, uh, and, and just uh, stay strong. And if you need any support, we are here for you through our services, whether it's for students, through our health services, or for the other ways in which uh, our human resources department uh, reaches out to, to help our faculty and staff. And before we wrap things up, is there anything else that you'd like to add, President Olean? I'll just add one other piece. Um, I think through this, we are continuing our um, commitment to the communities around us. Uh, we're, uh, I know that for, for some of our students, the move out was tough and, and not coming back uh, to campus. We did that really um, to safeguard the well being of not just our own uh, staff and students to avoid the crowding phenomenon, but also to safeguard our community that uh, we're not burdening them with any kind of contagion factor with so many people coming back into town. And we're very much part of the outreach into the community. Many of our students who live around here have been helping elderly citizens. Our medical and nursing students are involved in telemedicine, uh, uh, helping with telephone services. I'm on two of the governor's commissions around workforce planning and economic growth for the, for the state to help reimagine and reopen uh, Connecticut. Bethany Zamba, our vice president and uh, chief of staff, is in constant touch with the communities around us, delivering uh, some personal protection equipment. Uh, before the coronavirus hit, we were dealing with extra food distribution. We've helped with food um, through the kitchens here. Um, we've distributed masks and gloves. And um, there are many, many ways in which uh, we're helping through our own facilities. We have vacated facilities so that first responders 
police, fire, some people who are working in the healthcare system can stay there and be protected rather than endangering uh, their uh, families. So all of us should be proud of the ways in which Quinnipiac is part of the communities around us. And I want to thank our students and their families for letting us be responsive to these first responders who are doing God's work and, and need to be housed um, in separate quarters from their families. Uh, so I guess I'd, I'd like to end on that note that Quinnipiac cares, Quinnipiac is kind, Quinnipiac is strong and resilient. And thank you to every one of you, whether it's our students, our faculty or staff, you are doing something special to take us through this crisis and get us through the other side in a kind and generous way through your caring. Well, thank you very much for joining me, President Olian. Thank you, Brooke, and best of luck to you and to all of your classmates who are seniors. I know we're gonna be following you, we're gonna be proud of you, and we're gonna ride your coattails as you succeed through the various phases of your careers. And don't forget, you are Bobcat Strong and keep coming back. Thank you. Although the semester is coming to a close, Q3 News will continue to bring you coverage on the latest surrounding Quinnipiac and the Hamden area. Be sure to stay up to date by checking out our website, q30.tv, and following our social media pages at Q30 News. For one final time on Q30, I'm Brooke Riley. Stay healthy, everyone.